Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and start. So my name is Rachel Isaacson. Um, I'm with Community Solutions um, and we are hosting this Skillshare series and um, Community Solutions is an 80 year old nonprofit from, that originated in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Um, and their mission is to help teach communities how to be more resilient through turbulent times such as these. Um, we started this Skillshare series back in March when everything first began shutting down. We hosted many different um, Skillshare series in person, but um, we've moved online just to make it more accessible. And since people can't come in person anymore, we thought that this was a, a good way to continue to help folks. And um, we've had many different people come around this region to volunteer their time to um, help teach what they know. Um, and so we really are grateful that you're coming to learn and show support. Um, and we hope to see you as we continue the series into the year. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Emma Jackson, who is our presenter today. Okay. Thank you so much, Rachel, for the introduction. Thank you, Community Solutions and Dayton Fiber Shed for this opportunity. Um, so my name is Emma Jackson, and um, today I'm going to teach you how to ref refresh your wardrobe um, using natural dyes. First of all, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about me. I'm going to play a short slideshow. And um, I'm going to give you some tips on what you should know before you start dyeing. Um, and then I'm going to walk you through how to dye with onion skins and how to dye with the skins and stones from avocados. Um, after that, I'll give you some resources and we'll have time for Q&A. If you have any questions throughout this entire process, please use the chat um, to type your questions and I'll get to them. Um, as soon as I see them, feel free to shoot questions throughout this presentation. Um, I want this to be as interactive as possible for you. Um, there's no silly questions, so please feel free to reach out to me. Um, so first of all, I'm going to pull up our presentation here. Okay, let's get started. So I just want to start out by telling you a little bit about how I got here um, as a natural dyer. And um, I grew up in Dayton and always had um, a big background of art and music, um, was always really interested in a lot of different art forms. And um, my family really influenced me heavily in that way. Um, <clears throat> after living in Dayton for the majority of my youth, I moved out to Colorado after college um, for about five years, and that is where I was first introduced to natural dyes. Um, I actually started out as a weaver. Um, my grandmother was a weaver, and I was inspired by her um, to start learning that craft. And the world of weaving basically led me to learn about natural dyes. Um, so my grandmother, um, wove on a floor loom, um, and did a lot of rugs and things like that, um, household items, um, but I'm mostly a tapestry weaver, um, so I weave a lot of wall hangings and things like that, and I'll show you one of those, um, in a little bit that I did with incorporating natural dyes. Um, this picture is actually me in my garden in Colorado. Um, the plant that you see most prevalent, prevalently in front of me in this picture is actually indigo. Um, and in the back are some dahlias. These are all dye plants. So in Colorado, not only did I have the opportunity to meet people who were involved in these crafts and learn from them, but I also had the opportunity to start growing my own dye plants, um, which really, really connected me to this craft and is what um, basically brought my passion to where it is today. Um, 
it was a little bit harder for me to find people who were growing their own dye plants and then cultivating the natural dyes in that way. Um, a lot of people will dye um, more simply or order the dyes pre-made and pre-prepared from the internet. Um, but, you know, taking it from seed <clears throat> all the way to using it as a dye um, is something that was just really important for me to learn it step by step from the source. Um, <clears throat> so I, since I moved back here to Ohio, I've also been, you know, I've continued to grow dye plants um, on a much smaller scale than I did on a farm in Colorado. Um, but I continue to grow dye plants every year um, and every single year teaches you more and more. Um, so uh, part of what I was able to do out in Colorado is take a lot of classes um, to learn about a lot of different dyes. And then I got to the point where I went to a couple of classes and I realized, you know, I know basically as much or a little bit more than some of these teachers. And so I'm really ready to share my knowledge and share my journey. Um, and so that's, you know, a little bit about how I got to where I am today. <clears throat> I, um, I also had the opportunity to do a fiber camp, um, which I'm gonna include in my resources that I send you. Um, when I was in, in Colorado, I did a fiber camp, which um, we basically were on a farm where they raised their own sheep. We took the fiber from the sheep and took it all the way through the cycle of preparing it to dye it and then use it in crafts. So we, you know, cleaned it, skirted it, uh, the, the fleece from the, um, the sheep. Um, we got to then um, spin it into yarn and naturally dye it, um, both before it was spun and after. And then we got to weave with that dyed fiber. So, and I just wanted to share that, you know, to basically say there's so much to learn in these crafts. Um, and I definitely think with my background, I've been fortunate enough to see these things from the source and kind of be able to view it as a larger cycle. Um, <clears throat> and I was also, <clears throat> I'm gonna go to the next slide here. Um, I was also able to, I was invited to present on the fiber camp I attended um, at the Rocky Mountain Weavers Guild, which is the picture here on the left. Um, so I was able to share, you know, the knowledge that I gained from that with um, 200 plus other <laughs> weavers, which was quite the experience. Um, you know, they're weavers and natural dyers. And in that area, there's such a wealth of people doing these crafts. Um, they have a huge fiber community there. And so everything I've learned and taken away from that community is something I'm trying to foster here back in Dayton, um, back in my hometown and just regrowing roots here and trying to build the network within our fiber community. Um, and you know, using natural dyes is connected to all of that. On the right here are some of my tapestry weavings that I mentioned. Um, the one, the small one on the left side, the bottom um, threads where you see the pink, that's all dyed with avocado skins and stones, which we're gonna be getting into today. So I just wanted to give you this quick example of what that looks like firsthand. <clears throat> So um, before we get into uh, these tips on what to do before you die, um, I just wanted to touch on, you know, how throughout learning about natural dyes and, and dying for, I've been naturally dying for probably about four years now. Um, one of the biggest things I've become passionate about is being able to revive garments um, that are secondhand. Um, there are a lot of dyers out there that are dyeing brand new, sometimes handmade clothing. And that is, you know, it's absolutely beautiful work, but in my opinion, it makes it a little less accessible to a lot of people because you might not be able to afford that, um, you know, t-shirt, that handmade shirt um, that is then naturally dyed. These are all really slow cra crafts that require a lot of time. So um, especially if you're growing your own dye plants, um, it requires a significant amount of time. And so by using secondhand clothing, 
Um, it makes it definitely more accessible for most people um, to own naturally dyed garments. And the thing that I'm most passionate about is just extending the life of each garment in you know, the cycle, um, basically supporting a sustainable textile system. Instead of throwing away that old shirt or um, you know, a household item or a sheet or something like that that you're just not, doesn't bring you joy anymore or is getting kind of old, um, you can naturally dye it and give it new life. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, that is something I've become really passionate about along the way. And I also just wanted to take a moment to mention, you know, I think it's important with these crafts to really honor those that have come before us. Everything I'm going to teach you today is not, I did not come up with this. Um, this is something that I've practiced and continue to practice and learn every single time I die. These are ancient crafts. Um, a lot of natural dyes are, you know, probably some of the most ancient crafts. Um, we're talking, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, back in history, maybe using a natural pigment on a cave wall to paint a picture. Um, these are, you know, these have been used by people, um, whether they happened upon them or whether they became a part of an indigenous culture um, for a very, very long time. And that is especially true with, you know, some of the more involved dyes that we're not necessarily going to get into today. But I think it's important that if you want to start learning about natural dyes, um, you know, to really take the time to honor all of those that came before us and made it possible so that I can teach you this, you know, I can pass along these skills to you today. <clears throat> Okay, so let's get let's get into it now. So before you die, I'm just going to check on our participants here really quickly and make sure everybody is in who needs to be in. Okay. Uh, we have a question if you're ready for one. Okay, sure. Um, Laura asked, do you keep the original labels and clothing that you are dying or do you prefer to remove them and use your own labels? So um, that's something, you know, I've thought about using my own labels. And I think in the future, um, I may start just making a tag um, to go on things that I've revived with natural dyes. But for now, I just keep the labels as is because most of my work is just small scale commission work um, or I'm just dying things for myself um, or, you know, as gifts for friends and family. Um, so it really depends on what you're doing with it. If you're going to be selling these products, then, you know, it may make sense to um, sew on your little tag or attach your own label. Do we have any other questions so far? None that are stated in the chat, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them into the chat and we will be answering them throughout. Okay, um, so you know, bef <clears throat> before you die, there are some things you want to keep in mind. Um, first of all, natural dyes um, are things you know that come from nature. Uh, natural dyes are derived from something that is cultivated in nature. It's there's no chemical or synthetic components to it. So a lot of what we see in, um, you know, if you go to the mall or go to a store, most of what you're seeing are synthetic dyes. Um, and so natural dyes come from nature, come from plants, um, sometimes even insects. Um, there are so many sources of color in nature. Uh, even mushrooms and lichens produce different colors and the one of the most fascinating and exciting things about work, working with natural dyes is sometimes, you know, you may have no clue just by looking at it, what color is going to come out of this. So for instance, we're going to, um, I'm going to show you today how to dye with avocado skins and stones. Those produce um, rosy pink mauve, sometimes orangey peach shades. So, you know, just by thinking about like looking at the avocado skins and stones, you know, I never would have imagined that it would produce those rosy, beautiful colors. Um, so that's one of the most exciting things about working with these dyes. And 
keep in mind that this is not an exact science. Everything that I'm telling you today, you can adapt, you can experiment. Um, you know, nothing I'm telling you today is an absolute. You have to do it this way. Um, so feel free to have fun with this, experiment with your own items, um, make them your own. And as far as natural dyes in general, it is very hard to recreate. So each time you create a dye pot made out of onion skins, you may get a slightly different color. Um, so it's really fun to dye over and over again um, with the same thing, because each time you may get a slightly different shade. And I'll show you examples of that here in a little bit. Um, so before you dye, you also want to think about um, choosing your fiber or what you're going to dye. You have to choose a natural fiber. Um, and what this means is choosing something that is made out of protein fibers or cellulose fibers um, instead of synthetic fibers. So read the tag um, if you need to on the piece of clothing or try to make an educated guess about what you think um, you know, a, a, a piece of cloth or fiber is made out of. Um, <clears throat> protein fibers come from animals and examples of those are silk, alpaca, angora, like angora rabbit um, fur, uh, sheep's wool, wool is a big one, or cashmere. These are all fabrics that you can dye. Um, <clears throat> and protein fibers in general are going to give you usually slightly deeper shades and like a slightly deeper, um, yeah, I guess a shade or a depth of color is going to be a little more enhanced with protein fibers. <clears throat> I use primarily actually cellulose fibers, um, even though they tend to dye a little bit lighter and cellulose fibers come from plants. And <clears throat> examples of those are cotton, linen, hemp, things like that. So I tend to use a lot of cotton, linen, um, blends of those two. Um, the protein fibers I use the most are probably silk or wool. Um, those are also, you know, easier to find, especially when you're doing thrifted garments. It's usually easier to find, uh, you know, cotton, linen, silk. <clears throat> um, the reason why we're starting today with onion skins and avocado skins and stones is because these are beginner dyes. These are a great way to get started, especially if you've never dyed before. <clears throat> so um, they're safe to do indoors, which a lot of dyes are not. A lot of dyes you want to do outside um, because you, know, you need a lot of air ventilation um, <clears throat> for it to be a safe process. But with onion skins and avocado skins and stones, you can just do this right in your kitchen. It's food safe. It's safe to do with kids. Um, so you don't have to worry about it as much as you would other dyes. Um, the other point of, you know, me presenting these two dyes to you today is that you don't need a mordant. So when you start talking about natural dyes, you're going to hear the word mordant come up a lot. And what a mordant is, is it's basically a chemical binder or a chemical bridge. And some dyes need this in the process um, because it assists the dye and the fabric to bond to one another. And if you don't use a mordant with some dyes, the color will just not adhere to the fabric um, or it just will barely adhere unless you use a mordant. Um, just to keep things simple, I'm not going to get too much much into those today. Um, learn, you know, anything you need to know about those if you're interested in working with other dyes after this. Um, so no more needed with what we're going to do today. And that is because the onion skins and the avocado skins and stones themselves are so high, they're naturally high in tannin, which makes it, it helps the dye bind to the fabric. Um, those tannins do. And so um, that is why we don't need a mordant today with these specific dyes. Um, something else that helps as far as um, adding, uh, you know, getting the dye to bind to the fabric is using an aluminum pot. 
Um, sometimes when you are naturally dying, you use what's called alum. It's aluminum sulfate. Um, and so just having that little bit of like aluminum in there from the pot may help just slightly. Um, I still use stainless steel pots a lot and I don't notice a huge difference with the aluminum pots, but um, you know, it doesn't hurt to use a, an aluminum pot for your dye pot um, along those lines. Okay, <clears throat> so um, a couple more points before we jump into the dyes here. I just want to talk about the colors um, being fugitive or fast with natural dyes. So, you know, some colors are more fugitive and some colors are more color fast, um, which means they hold the color longer. You'll have a brighter shade for longer. Um, fugitive, um, some dyes are so fugitive that they'll just wash right out and they're not going to be able to withstand natural light from the sun or washing, like repeated washing like you would a shirt or an article of clothing. Um, for instance, um, like beets or black beans. Those are two dyes that are just pretty fugitive. Um, so when I dye with those, I only dye things like yarn that I'm not going to wash a bunch of times. Um, so uh, all, all natural dyes are to some extent fugitive. And in the natural light, they're always going to fade over time. So, you know, you might get a couple you might get, I'd say, a year or a little more than that um, regular wear if you're wearing a shirt all the time um, before it's going to fade enough to where you're going to be like, OK, I, I want to dye this again. Um, but that's, you know, part of the fun, uh, in my opinion, is um, you can just refresh the color later um, and you can dye it a different color at that point if you want to. Again, extending the life of your garment um, that you have. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> one more thing to keep in mind um, when you're getting started is if you're thrifting something to dye or if it's a really old shirt um, that you've had for a really long time that you maybe spilled something on in the past or you've sweat a lot in it or something like that, um, there is the potential that if you try to dye it uh, it will kind of die unevenly where the fabric has been stained in some way. Um, personally, I don't really care about that. Like I like the uneven markings. It makes the garment look really interesting sometimes. Um, but if you are worried about dyeing something that's really old or may have some stains on it, you can always do what's, what's called scouring first, which is a type of cleaning the garment. Um, and scouring is basically a fancy word to just say simmering it in hot water um, with a, a little bit of white vinegar. That is how I scour things if they're really dirty. But honestly, for the most part, I don't really care about the uneven dyeing. So I just go ahead and um, wash them normally and then dye with them. <clears throat> um, so, okay, we're going to get started here, um, just walking through the dye process in a minute. Um, one last thing before we jump into that, I just want to say, you know, these are slow crafts. Uh, I don't have, we don't have time together today for me to go through every single step in the process with you um, because it takes time. And so this is something I'm going to walk you through each step in the process so you can get started today. And you can um, continue dying this weekend if you'd like. You can start on any other day um, and just hang out and listen if you'd like. Um, but I am going to walk you through all these processes so that you're prepared to do this on your own. But these are slow crafts. So please take it easy. Try to keep it simple. Um, you know, don't put pressure on yourself like you're not doing it the right way or whatever. Feel free to ask questions. Um, you'll have the opportunity to reach out to me after this as well if you have questions um, while you're dying um, after this webinar. Um, and so, you know, just keep it simple and fun. Um, it doesn't need to be too technical and rigorous if you don't want it to be. Okay. 
So um, I am going to switch over here to start sharing with you um, dyeing with onion skins. So Rachel, could you highlight my other screen? Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna check for questions really quickly before we move forward. How much white vinegar goes into water for scouring? So um, it depends on how much water you're using in the pot. Um, I usually, honestly, like I'm a pretty improvised uh, dyer. <laughs> so I, you know, if I'm scouring, I'll just like put a little tiny slosh of vinegar in there or, you know, measure out, out about a tablespoon. Like, I think that would be plenty, especially if you have a gallon or two of water. Um, and, you know, sometimes I scour without even using vinegar. Um, you know, just getting it in that really hot water is going to help get it clean. You could even just use like a very light amount of a soap solution, um, kind of more so hand washing the item. You never want to boil it either. You never want it to get too, too hot, especially when you're working with uh, sensitive fibers like wool. Um, so you're just simmering it, you know, just to get some help get some of that dirt and any staining or anything like that out. Okay, that looks like all of our questions for now. So I'm gonna jump in and walk you through how to dye with onion skins. Um, just as a reminder, if you have questions throughout this, just put them in the chat. Um, please stay muted and I will answer everyone's questions as soon as I see them. Okay. <clears throat> so. For our process today, I already made the dyes that we're working with um, so that I can show you basically parts of the entire process. So um, in order to dye with onion skins, which is the one we're going to start with, first you want to start collecting a bunch of onion skins. So you can see here I have a huge jar full. Um, I've probably been collecting these for about four to six months. <laughs> it really depends on how much you eat onions. Um, so, you know, and some of my cousins and my mom, they really love my uh, dye processes and they've actually started helping me collect onion skins too. So that's pretty fun because I can keep a really healthy stash on hand. Um, so you only want to take, you know, these really dry outer layers like this crunchy stuff that comes off the onion. There may be some layers on the onion underneath that that are a little bit moist and you don't really want to use those because they can mold. Um, you know, these dry crunchy parts, you can save them indefinitely and then die when you're ready. Excuse um, me, Eva. the yeah. camera's not switched. Uh -oh. I have it so that the video is spotlighted. I'm not sure if. Um, make sure you put it on speaker view and not gallery view. Maybe that will help. Yeah, so in the top corner, um, right where it says like enter full screen, you're gonna see something that says you can either put it in gallery view um, or speaker view. You wanna make sure you have it in speaker view. That's in the top right corner. It says view, and if you click on that, you can hit speaker view, and then you should be able to see the presentation screen. Let us know in the chat if you're still having any issues. Oh, I see your kitty. Hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is Sydney. She's going to try to be our little helper today because she can't stay away. But um, <laughs> yeah, other folks are wondering if you could move your camera, but I'm not sure. Um, other, like it seems like it's kind of like there's some folks saying that they need the, you need you to turn your camera and other people said that they can see everything just fine. I can see everything just fine. Yeah, so one more time, just make sure you're on speaker view. Um, my, the iPhone camera is spotlighted. 
it is spotlighted to the iPhone, so you should be able to hit speaker view instead of gallery view, and you should be able to see the demo screen. Okay. It looks like some people can see perfectly. Um, again, if you have any questions or are still having issues, just let us know. And this, um, and this is being recorded and we'll be sending this out to folks afterwards too. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry for anyone that's having issues. I cannot move the camera at this point. So um, you can try to switch to speaker view or click on the demo screen. Um, yeah, this is being recorded and will also be sent to you afterwards. Um, with the demo screen spotlighted. So if you're having any issues, um, you should be able to play this back if you need to. Okay, so um, once you've gathered, you know, a bunch of onion skins and, uh, you know, you could start with honestly, like much less than this, just to start out. I wouldn't worry too much about how many onion skins you have. Um, but I will say that the more you have, the more potent your color is going to be. So just keep that in mind. You can use red onion skins or yellow. Um, you can use them combined uh, without separating them, or you can separate them out and just, you know, have fun with it. See what slightly different shades you get by using red versus yellow or using them both together. Um, yeah, and Rachel just put in the chat that we're also live streaming this on Facebook. So if you're still having issues seeing the demo screen, um, feel free to try to switch over to the live stream on Facebook if that's helpful to you. Okay, so once we have all of our onion skins, we would basically pour all of these into a pot. <clears throat> and I'm using these really big aluminum pots. This one um, is enamel, and these two are aluminum. Um, as far as the pots go, like I said, onion skins are food safe. So if you don't have a separate you know, pot to dye in, if you're just doing onion skins and avocado skins and stones, you are fine. These are food safe things that you can just wash out after. Um, but if you do, if you are able to find like a big pot, um, it works really well because you want uh, your garment to be able to float around freely in here and move around freely once you put it in the dye. Um, I've found, honestly, every single one of my dye pots at a thrift store or uh, in the trash. So like this one was just sitting on top of a trash can. Um, so these things are really easy to find. You don't need to spend a bunch of money on these supplies. Um, so you pour all of your dried onion skins into the pot and then pour water over top so that all of your dye stuff is covered. And I usually, you know, fill up my pot to about three fourths of the way full so that I have plenty of water in there um, because you're going to let your onion skins sit and simmer in here. So some of the water is going to evaporate, evaporate off as well while it's sitting there and getting hot. Um, so I like to fill it up pretty full so that I don't necessarily have to top it off too many times if I do at all. Um, so once you have all your onion skins in here with the water, you basically are just going to simmer it on your stove or your, you know, electric stove top, whatever you have. You just want to simmer it, never boil it. Um, and you can do this from anywhere from an hour to a day. I mean, I have let onion skin or dye pots sit on my stove and simmer for an entire day before. Um, it also depends on, you know, if you have other stuff going on, this is a good passive process where you can just set a timer for it and walk away. Um, sometimes I'll just set a timer for two hours, come back, check on the color, maybe give it a little stir. 
you know, maybe give the onion skins a little stir, make sure it's not boiling, uh, make sure it's getting hot, and then I'll just let it keep simmering until I'm happy with the color. And you can just use a clear jar to look at the color that you're coming up with. So you can see this is a nice yellowy brown. And I was really happy with that color when I made this. So that's when I knew, okay, I don't need to keep simmering this anymore um, in order to get the color out of the onion skins. So um, we have questions. Can you show about how many onion skins and quantity of water you use in a single batch to get the best color? So it really depends on the size of the dye pot you're using. Um, I wouldn't worry about it being very, very specific quantities. Um, it really doesn't need to be that rigorous. I would start with about a jar this full of onion skins. Um, I like to fill up this jar because there's so many more in here. It's going to give me a deeper color. Um, but, you know, even if you just have a couple handfuls, you'll still be able to naturally dye a light yellow color. And just to be clear, the um, onion skins are dyeing us yellow and orange shades. And then we'll get to the pinks after this when we get to the avocado skins and stones. Um, so just to try to answer your question a little bit better, just in the pot I'm using, I'll pour all the onion skins that I have on hand, and then I fill it up about three fourths of the way full with water. And honestly, I, you know, I'm not super technical. I don't keep track of the exact quantities. Um, if you want to come up with a tried and true recipe for yourself, feel free to measure out exact quantities and then just take notes on what works best for you. Um, you know, if you like the color, you can just repeat that recipe for yourself. Have you ever used a combo of onion skins and turmeric since they are both yellow? Um, I have not dyed with turmeric yet, actually. Um, it's something I've been interested in, but uh, I haven't really, <laughs> I haven't really um, figured out a way to source it super sustainably. Um, it's also a little bit more of a fugitive color with turmeric. Um, it doesn't last quite as long, um, so I've read. And, but if that would be very interesting to try onion skins and turmeric together. That would be a really cool experiment. And, you know, I encourage you to give it a try. Does the water need to be warmed? Yes. So you put your onion skins in the water or you put your onion skins and then the water, whatever one, it doesn't matter which order. And you let it simmer for, I would sim let it simmer for at least an hour minimum. And then check your color using a jar. <clears throat> Um, once you're happy with the color um, and your dye is ready to go, you're going to strain all of the onion skins out of the dye. And I'm going to show you this live with the avocado skins and stones here in a minute. But with this particular dye pot, I've already strained it. Um, so just hold tight. I'm going to show you how to strain that in the next demo. Um, I'll show you a couple different ways to strain it. Um, we're going to be using cheesecloth, um, but you can also use a strainer, just a basic strainer. Um, so you're going to strain all of the onion skins out of the dye. So you need at least two pots in order to do natural dyes. You want at least two uh, vessels because when you go to strain out the onion skins out of your dye pot, you're going to need to pour it into another vessel. So in this case, I actually did all of my onion skin heating up and all that good stuff in here, got the dye ready, and then I strained all of the dye into this pot. Um, before you dye any fiber at all, you wanna do what's called wetting out. And that is putting whatever garment you're dyeing, here's a shirt that I'm gonna show you later. Uh, I'm gonna put this in the avocado skins later. Um, but this has been wetted out. All it is, is you just put it in water and you can use a bowl for this. It doesn't have to be a pot. You can use a bowl or a bucket because you're not going to heat this. It's just sitting in water so that the fiber gets really wet. And you want to do that because 
before you put it in the dye, you're going to wring this out completely and then put it in the dye. And because it's already been wetted thoroughly, then it, it takes in the dye much easier. So, um, and I would wet out your, you know, put your garment or whatever it is you're dyeing in the water, make sure the water is high enough to cover it completely and let it sit in there for at least 10 to 15 minutes. Um, there have been times when I go and prep a dye and then I go prep my fibers and I just leave them there until I'm ready to dye. So, I mean, you could let it sit in there for as long as you want, but I would do a minimum of 10 to 15 minutes. Um, as far as the question, have you ever tried using garlic skins? Um, I have not done garlic skins. Um, I would not expect them to yield any color um, because they are so white and really, really thin. Um, but, you know, that's the cool thing with natural dyes. You could try anything. So, um, you know, if you feel uh, inspired to try garlic skins, give it a try. Let me know what, what comes out. <laughs> Um, okay, so as far as the next steps with the onion skin dye pot, you have now strained all of your dye into this pot. There's no more skins in here anymore. And um, the dye is still warm, you know, from when we had it on the stove. And then I'm going to go ahead and put in whatever I want to dye. Just put it right in the dye and then you're going to keep it on the stove and let it simmer. Um, this is especially important where you don't want it to ever boil or get too hot. It really doesn't take much. Um, some people, and I've done this as well, some people will just in the summer months go put this outside in the sun and just let it solar die instead of putting it on the stove. It doesn't take much heat in order to get the color to, you know, bind to your garment or your fiber, but it does take some heat. And so right when you put it in, right when you put in your fiber or your garment, you might notice it starts to take color, but then it won't really get the full deep color of the dye until you simmer it in there for a while. And again, I would let anything you're dyeing simmer for a minimum of an hour, um, if not more. Yesterday, I had things simmering in this dye pot for probably four or five hours on end um, because I was just doing other things. And I just kept, I just, like I said, set a timer for two hours, come back and check on it. And then whenever I'm happy with it, I will take it out. Um, sometimes I leave things, you know, I'll simmer it all day in the, in the dye. And then I'll just turn off the stove and let it sit in there all night while the dye cools. And then in the morning, I pull it out. And that's actually my favorite way to do it because it's taking it very slowly. And then you're just giving it the utmost time to, to, to get all that good color. <clears throat> um, someone in the chat said, do we heat up the water? Yes. Um, so if you're just now joining, um, yes, you heat the water when you have your onion skins in there. And then after you strain it out, after you strain out all the skins and you're just working with the dye, yes, you heat it again. And you're always just going to simmer. We just want a little bit of heat. Um, so like I said, this has been dying since yesterday. So, um, you know, let's pretend that I just turned this off last night. It was simmering all evening for a few hours. And then this morning, I came up to my dye pot here. And, you know, this is a vintage napkin that used to be white. Um, so you can see this is a very nice, deep orangey color. And I do not get this orange color every time I dye with onion skins. A lot of times it is a very pale yellow. So, you know, this is a very nice color that we got out of this. Um, this, I believe, is a linen cotton blend. Just by feeling it, I can tell it's not pure cotton. Um, so, you know, cotton versus linen versus silk, they're all going to give you slightly different shades in the same dye. 
Um, so this is an example of a cotton linen blend. It's just a vintage uh, napkin or handkerchief. Um, so after I'm, I'm happy with this, so I want to take it out of the dye. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, wring it out as much as I possibly can. And then I'm going to rinse it under water. Um, just take it to the sink and you can rinse it, rinse it, rinse it until you see the water um, coming out clear until there isn't mo any more like yellow color coming out of it. Um, it is totally normal to see some yellow color coming out of it when you rinse it. So just rinse it really, really well. Um, another even more eco-friendly way to rinse your dyed garments, and I, I like to do this a lot in the summer when it's warm and I can do this outside, um, is just have a bucket or another vessel full of water and you can just dip it in the water and then pull it out and let, let the water just fall out of it. And that way you're just dipping and then lifting up, dipping, lifting up, dipping, lifting up, and you're rinsing it that way instead of just having a continuous stream of water going from your sink. Um, so that's another option as far as rinsing after you've died. So after we've rinsed, I just hang this up to dry um, on a drying rack. I only air dry these nice dyed things. And um, depending on what it is, if it's just, you know, an old cotton t-shirt, I might just throw it in the washer and then throw it in the dryer. But for most things, right after I've dyed them, I just hang them on an air drying rack. Um, it's also very important to note, don't hang your freshly dyed items in the direct sunlight because that is going to cause it to fade. Um, with that being said, I definitely have hung my dyed garments on a clothesline before um, to dry. I kind of learned that the hard way. Some dyes fade so much quicker than others in the natural light, um, but that's just something to be aware of. If you do hang it in the direct sun, it's going to fade the color a lot. And this color you see here, um, this is wet. Once this dries, it's going to look slightly lighter than this. And that is, that is true with all natural dyes. So when you pull it out, it's sometimes really exciting to see, oh, look at the depth of this color, but you have to keep in mind, it's going to look a little bit lighter than this when it's done drying. And I actually already dyed another one of these um, and dried it. And I have that here. So look at that. This is wet and this is dry. This is the same dye. This is the same fabric. These are the same napkins. This is so much more orange when it's wet. And then <clears throat> it's harder to see this on the camera. It still has a little bit of an orangey hue to it, this dried one, but just look at how different the color is after it dries. So you wanna stay tuned when you're dying, uh, you know, give it some time and then see what you really come out with after it dries. If you're like, oh, this is too light and you, and you want the color to be deeper, just try to dye it again. Um, and you know, over dyeing it, you may get a deeper color. So I'm gonna um, go to the chat really quick and check on our questions. Is the dye reusable? Yes, this is an excellent question. You can dye in this same dye pot until you're not getting color anymore until you try to dye something and you pull it out and it's not working. That means your dye is exhausted. And so you're welcome to use it as many times as you want. Um, in this dye pot alone, I dyed these two napkins. I dyed this sweater that I'm gonna show you here in a minute. And I also dyed this headband. And this is a little sample. Um, a little cotton piece of t-shirt. I just cut up a t-shirt and I use these as samples. Um, so when I first start dying, if I'm like, oh, I really love this, these napkins and I'm not sure if this is gonna be the right color, I can throw a little sample in there, let it simmer, let it, you know, let it die just like you would anything else and then pull it out. And if you're like, oh, I really like that color, okay, I'm ready to dye. I'm ready to dye my napkins because I know I really like that color. So that's another way to test it out. 
um, before you go all in if you want to. And this is dried. So you can see how different, you know, this is a little bit more orangey. Um, and this is cotton. This is just a cotton t-shirt. Um, so compared to the, you know, linen blend, they're pretty close. You can't really see on the camera, but the cotton is a little bit more orangey. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the next question is, do you ever store dye liquor in the refrigerator to use later? And if so, how long will it last in the refrigerator? That's an excellent question. Yes, I have um, stored dye in the fridge to use later before. Um, I would not leave it in there for more than like a day or two because just like any food, it's gonna eventually go bad. Um, I think, you know, the fresher, the better. But if you really have to walk away from it and come back to it, uh, you can store it in the fridge if you feel the need to. Sometimes I will just put a towel or a lid over a dye pot, um, you know, with the heat off and I'll come back to it the next day and I don't even put it in the fridge. Um, and then in the summer months, as I mentioned, I could just leave this outside with my um, napkins and garments in here and let it sit in the sun if I need to take a break. Just let it keep dying that way instead of having to put it in the fridge. Um, but if you are worried about it going bad and you are like, oh, I want to come back maybe two days later and dye, use this dye, then yeah, you can put it in the fridge, no problem. Um, do shibori techniques work with this onion skin dye? That is a great um, transition question. Uh, before we move on to the avocado skins and stones, I want to show you this sweater that I dyed with this onion skin dye. So. This was a white sweater. Um, as you can see, it has little tie dye patterns on it. And I did this by, I dyed it in a lighter onion skin vat, uh, dye pot. So not this one, I dyed this previously with a much lighter concentration of onion skins. And that is what got this lighter color here this lighter yellow. And then after I, you know, I let it dry, um, you know, I, I brought this through the whole process and then I washed it. Um, and then I made this very concentrated onion skin dye pot with much more onion skins. And I dyed this again, but first I put little rubber bands. Like I just bunched up the fabric randomly and put little rubber bands around it, like a just a traditional tie-dye technique, um, just like how you would tie-dye anything. Um, and then I put it in the dye with the rubber bands on it. Like obviously it's wetted out first, so it's wetted out. And then um, with the rubber bands on it, it's wetted out. And then I let it simmer in the dye. And because the color is this orangey, much more concentrated yellow, um, you know, it allowed for these patterns to come through on the sweater. There. Um, and your question says, do shibori techniques work with this onion skin dye? For anyone that doesn't know, shibori is um, a Japanese art form of creating resist dye patterns. I, I don't claim to know shibori. Um, I don't know that practice. It is another ancient craft. Um, that I just want to take a second to honor. Um, that's not what I'm trying to do here. I am not proficient in shibori, um, but I just experiment and make these little tie-dye patterns um, or use random objects to try to create resist patterns. Um, so a little bit more less involved than the practice of shibori. <clears throat> okay, um, so for the sake of time, I'm going to move us on to um, avocado skins and stones. And I'm going to show you a little bit more of that. I'm going to switch out the dye pot here really quickly. Okay. <clears throat> The 
the question in the chat says, can you jar the rest of your dye bath for reuse later? Sorry. Yes, you can jar the rest of your dye bath if you don't want to keep it in the pot. Um, can you use colored garments? Will it change the color of the object? Yes, you can use colored um, you can use colored garments, but keep in mind that if it's a really really dark shade, it may not work. Um, for instance, if you're trying to dye a really dark brown or black, like it's not really going to do anything in the onion skins. Um, so I would go with gray, uh, super light yellows or creams. Um, I do white most often, white and cream or light gray. Um, I even do light blue a lot. Um, that's a really fun one to do, especially with something like onion skins, because you're going to get, you know, green from that. If you dye something that's already blue, it's going to come out green. Um, so yeah, have fun with that. Um, definitely try out colored garments. Um, you can always try it. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, <clears throat> you've just learned something for next time. Um, so we're going to transition now to doing avocado skins and stones. And I'm going to walk you through that process as well. If you are ready to dye today and you want to get started, go ahead and put you know, whichever one you want to do first, your onion skins or your avocado skins and stones in the pot, fill it with water and get that baby on the stove. Um, and then everything I'm going over with you today, um, I'll teach you all the next steps so that you're ready to die today. So, okay, let's see here. <clears throat> For the avocado skins and stones, where's my avocado? Here it is. <clears throat> okay, so you start with an avocado. I take off the sticker. And when I go to eat this, um, you know, I just cut it in half. And then I'll usually use a half of an avocado at a time. Um, once I, I use a spoon usually to scoop out the avocado um, and eat it. And then I just set the skins and the pit aside. And then when I'm done eating avocado, I will wash off the skins and the uh, stones in, in water, just in water. So these are already dried, but just to give you an idea, here's your avocado skin. And after I use these, you know, there's like some avocado on here. I just hold it under the water and do this and just rub it with my fingers until I get any like little bits of avocado off there. Um, and, and you know, if you don't wanna use your hands, you can use a little scrubby or whatever you have. This is dried, so it's a little crunchy, but this is a pit and I would do the same thing. I just like use a scrubby or use my fingers to scratch off any food bits that are still on there. And then I like to dry my avocado skins and pits. Um, I just dry them out. After I wash them, I literally just put these on my dish rack and I'd let them dry out. And then, um, you know, once they get a little bit drier, I might move them to a sunny window. Um, it helps if you lay them out flat to dry. Um, don't like stack a bunch of these on top of each other because then it's more likely to mold. If one of your avocado skins or stones molds, that's fine. Just get rid of it. If you're not going to die right away, you can get rid of that and just save your other ones. Um, you know, I can never salvage all of the avocado skins and stones, um, though I may want to. You know, usually one or two of them mold, and, it, and you can just compost that or throw it out. So once you have, um, I'd say, you know, even five or six, I would start with five or six avocados worth of skins and stones. Um, if you don't wanna dry them out, you can freeze them. Um, so I know a lot of natural dyers, I prefer personally to dry them out. And then I just, once they're completely dry and I know they're not gonna mold, they've been sitting out and drying for days on end. I keep them all in a jar until I have about you know, about this jar full. Once again, I am not a rigorous dyer. Um, <clears throat> I just go until I'm ready to die pretty much. 
So if you want to just do, you know, four to six avocados worth of skins and stones, and then just like with the onion skins, you're going to put them in the pot, pour water on it, and you're going to let that simmer. Um, let it simmer, simmer for, uh, with the avocado skins and stones, I would recommend simmering them longer. Um, I would recommend doing a minimum of maybe two to three hours of simmering your dye stuff in the pot. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. I'm just going to check the chat for questions real quick. I assume we're not able to dye today if we have not pre-soaked fabric. Um, well, you know, you could just put your fabric in a, a pot of water right now while we're talking um, so that you can get started here uh, after you've let your fabric wet out for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so that doesn't mean you can't dye today. You can definitely get started. Um, but, you know, these are slow crafts, so we can't do it all together today. Um, but feel free to get started while we're talking, please. <clears throat> So the next person says, I have several months worth of avocado skins and pits. They were scooped out, but I wasn't meticulous about rinsing or scraping off every tiny particle. At the bottom of the bag, there's some mold. Does this matter? Um, I would throw out the ones that are moldy. Um, if I were you, it probably is not a great idea to simmer that in your kitchen. Um, <clears throat> I would just save the ones that are in good condition and try to dye with those. Also, if you're doing something like, you could just buy five, six uh, avocados, make a, big, make a big pot of guacamole, and then use the avocado skins and pits right then and there on that day to dye. You don't have to save them for a long time like I do if you wanna do it all in a day. Um, I just only go through about a half an avocado or one avocado at a time. Um, you know, without making guacamole when you're just using them for your toast or whatever, you go through less at a time. So that's why I like to dry them and save them. But if you want to just make a big pot of guacamole, use a bunch of avocados and then prep it and throw them right in the dye pot, go for it. Um, do you have to use both the skins and the stone? That's a great question. No, you do not. Um, you are going to get color variations. Um, if you use the skins only or the pits only, you might get a slightly more pink dye pot. You might get a slightly more orangey, like peach dye pot. Um, so, and, and, and it's, it, it's variable. So each time could be different. Um, but you can choose to use only skins if you want to, or only pits if you want to. I just love using both because it's more dye stuff, which means you're going to get you know, a deeper color, the more dye that you have. So um, <clears throat> do we put salt or vinegar or anything else to soak the fabric? <clears throat> no, I just wet it out in water. If you want to wash or scour the fabric before you wet it out, that's a different process. And I'll give you resources that you can look into on even more ways to scour or wash before you get to this point. Um, but just when you're just wetting it out, it's just water. Okay, so back to the avocado skins and stones dye pot. So I simmered this dye uh, for about, honestly, probably five or six hours yesterday. Um, so there are just a bunch of skins and stones in here still all my dye stuff still in here. Um, but I wanted to see what it was going to look like before I strained it out. And I wanted to be able to show you guys a sample. So I put a few really small things in here. And this is also to show you, like, you can put your garment or your fabric or your fiber in there with the dye stuff. If you want to make it crazy easy and just throw it in there with it, you don't have to strain it out just go for it. But you should know that it's going to take you longer to wash the garment afterwards because little pieces of the avocado skins and stones are going to stick to your fabric. You also might have a little bit more uneven dyeing if like parts of the dye stuff are just sitting on the fabric. 
but I think it's fun to experiment with. So maybe try it both ways. Um, just, you know, it's whatever works for you. So, um, but I am gonna strain this out. Here is a little tiny wool. Um, this is a little wool ball that I put in here. It was white and it just came out like a tan. Um, but this is something that I've been working on just dyeing a bunch of different colors of these little wool balls, like all different colors. Um, and I like to use these as samples because they're so small. Um, and so that gives you an idea of what wool is gonna look like if you decide to dye wool in this dye pot. Um, so these I'm eventually gonna string, uh, like sew them into a little garland. Um, but here's a good example of just some wool Wool balls, that's another really fun thing you could dye. And then the other sample I put in here <laughs> is um, when you buy sheets, sometimes they come in this fabric uh, case that is like, you're never really gonna use it again. You just you know pull the sheets out of it and then you just have this random Velcro thing that the sheets came in. So I decided to dye this because it was really pretty. Um, this is white. This was white when I put it in there and it, it already had this little embroidery on it that would match this color. And um, this is still wet, so it's gonna dry, you know, obviously a little bit lighter than this. But this is a good idea of what cotton's going to look like if I put cotton in here, because these are 100% cotton sheets. Um, if you're dyeing a whole set of sheets, this actually this thing that comes with some sheets is a good sample. I mean, that's a great sample to see what your sheets are going to look like before you go all in. I'm just going to wring that out really good. And then to finish this, I would just rinse it really well and hang it to dry. Um, but with these things, I have a friend who likes to sew um, and I asked her to make little napkins, like re reusable napkins that I can use. <clears throat> so she sews me these little napkins out of these, you know, I'm just pausing for a second. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a bad connection. Okay, it looks like we're back on. But anyways, my friend makes these little napkins out of these random sheet things. So, you know, taking some random scrap fabric and making it functional. Okay, so as far as straining out, um, the questions say, do you mix the dye mixture periodically as you are simmering? Yes, I come back and check it every hour or every two hours. Um, I use this spoon, this slotted spoon to dye with. And I like to mark all my dye tools with this pink duct tape, just so I make sure, you know, I'm not gonna mix up my dye tools with my kitchen tools. Um, even though we are dyeing food safe today, um, that's just like a good tip or best practice, but I do come back and stir it um, every hour or so. Um, <clears throat> and then with the avocado, sorry, a really quick tip before we strain this. The avocado skins and stones, as you know, the stones you put in there are really big and I like to simmer them until I can break them apart a little bit. Like um, a bunch of these are in little pieces these stones. And honestly, you know, I would maybe even simmer this a little bit longer. Um, and then I use a potato masher to once this is, you know, has simmered for quite a while, a few hours, the pits should get start to get soft enough that I can put this in here and just press down on the pits really hard and break them up into little pieces. 
And the more surface area you have of the dye stuff, the more color you're going to get out of it. So if you really want to get the most color possible out of the avocado pits, especially if you're using only pits, this is a great little tip. Um, just try to mash them. And if they're too hard still when you go to do that, just simmer your dye for, you know, a couple more hours. Uh, go do something else, set a timer, and come back and try to mash them again. Once you're happy with the color, um, maybe you've put a sample in it like this, or you've tested it in your jar. Look at how dark that is. That's some really dark, I can see in person it has like a pinkish hue to it, um, but it just looks like really dark brown. Um, I like how potent that is. That looks great, how dark that is. So I know that I'm ready to strain the dye. <clears throat> okay. So in order to strain this, I need my other vessel. So I have this other pot that I'm going to use to strain it with. If you don't have cheesecloth or like a muslin thin cloth that you can strain this through, you can always just use a little kitchen strainer like this. Um, just make sure that, you know, if you have a ton of avocado pits and skins, it's obviously not going to fit very well in something like this. So just make sure your strainer is big enough. Um, but if you, you know, if you don't want to go out and buy cheesecloth or whatever, you can use whatever you have at home because these are food safe dyes. <clears throat> so my preference is cheesecloth and I'm going to show you two types of cheesecloth. This is just like the random uh, cheesecloth you get at Kroger's that costs $4 in the utensil aisle. Um, I've used this and used this so many times that it's like ragged <laughs> and it doesn't look like any more like it does when you buy it and it's really stained because I just use this over and over again. Um, I wash it and then use it over and over to dye. Um, so this is one kind of cheesecloth and then another kind is looks like more like this. And this is a little bit nicer material. It's actually 100% um, organic. Um, so I've been trying to, you know, buy a little bit nicer cheesecloth when I can. Um, but to strain this, I'm just going to use, you know, this is folded. This is folded into two pieces, but you could just do one um, piece and the cheesecloth. Here's a pack of it to show you. The cheesecloth usually comes in this really big piece. So you can just cut however big of a piece you need. You don't have to use that whole thing. Hey, Rachel, I just want to check in really quick and make sure you can still hear me all right. I know it looks like I'm having a little bit of connection issues on my end here and there. So I just want to make sure everyone's still all good. Um, yeah, I can just, hear you loud and clear. Okay, excellent. Okay, so um, as far as straining, I chose to cut this little bit bigger piece of cheesecloth off and fold it into two or fold it in half so that there's two layers. And then I just have this really big rubber band and I'm just going to wrap the rubber band around here. And like the cloth is sticking out the ends here so that it stays firm when I start pouring the dye on this. And I always like press it down just a tiny bit to make a little divot in here to hold all of the avocado skins and stones. And then I'm literally just gonna pour this slowly. You can see how dark the dye is. I'm just going to pour this really slowly. The dye stuff's going to start coming here in a second. I 
I like to use my hands a lot in this process because I really don't mind getting dirty, but you can do this with a spoon. Just scrape out all the dye stuff. And all that dye stuff that's sitting on top of this uh, cheesecloth now is just dripping. You know, all the dye is dripping through this cheesecloth into the pot. And you can actually see there's like all these little tiny pieces of avocado stones in here because I tried to mash these up. So these have really mashed into smaller pieces. Some of them are just halves like this, but there's a lot of really small little bitty broken up pieces in here that have been mashed, which is just going to give me more color. And I like to, um, you know, it's usually good to strain your dye into a pot that's either a little bit bigger than this or about the same size because you got to think about is what you're dyeing going to fit into this pot with room to move around. So you don't want your fabric or fiber to be super um, constrained in the dye pot. You want it to be able to move around in the dye freely. Um, so just think about that when you're choosing your pots. Hey, Emma. Yeah? Um, for some reason, the audio is now quieter, and I'm not sure what happened or why, but... asking me if I'm playing music. <laughs> no, I'm not. Can you hear me okay? It's okay. Um, it's just not as what it was. It hmm. I'm not sure. I haven't changed anything on my end. Yeah, it didn't seem like it. Well, I just wanted to see if there's anything that could be done. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm not sure. I haven't changed anything. Um, if you're having trouble hearing, um, you know, try to watch what I'm doing here. Yeah, people are saying I can't hear you now. Okay. There it is. It's better now. It there may, you are. It may just be my internet connection, honestly. Um, okay. I want to make sure I got all these questions. I know that we're getting close to time. Um, so, you know, if anyone has to go before this is over, we are probably going to go a little over 2.30. So feel free to stay as long as you can. I'm going to show the rest of this process and then I'm going to um, give you some resources. Um, but uh, I want to make sure these questions get answered. Are the dregs okay to put out into a compost pile? Yes. Um, with any natural dye, you can compost it when you're done. Um, even sometimes if I don't feel like using the dye in some other way, I'll just pour the entire dye pot on my garden. It's like basically like a compost tea. These are all really natural things that you can just pour into your yard. Um, when you're done, you can put the dye stuff in a compost um, just to make it as sustainable as possible. Okay, so now that this is strained out, I'm just gonna, you know, very slowly, I've got my fingers around the rubber banded part here. And then you just gotta make sure it doesn't like fall in. So I could try to grab like several sides like that. And then you're just gonna take it all up into a little bundle. And then I'm gonna squeeze this a little bit. Make sure I get as much dye out of this as possible. And it's actually like not much is coming out of this. So it's already pretty strained. And then this is something, you know, you can pour this stuff into a compost pile and then wash and reuse your cheesecloth. I'm just gonna set that there for now. So we have our dye in here. And um, so, you know, ideally this is still warm um, from when you simmered the pits and skins. If it's not, that's perfectly okay. You're going to have another opportunity to warm it up here in a second. Um, so now I'm going to, you know, you could put it back on the stove at this point, um, get it on low heat, ready to simmer again. This has boiled down so much 
um, to where the dye is less than half right now. Um, so, you know, ideally you're going to want to have enough water or liquid in here that it covers whatever you're dyeing. So if you have to top it up off with water, that's fine. Um, you know, do what you have to do, pour a little water in there. As long as your fabric is covered, you're good to go. Um, <clears throat> so let me show you with this shirt. I have this shirt completely wetted out. So I'm going to wring it out as best I can. Wring out as much water as you can from that pre-wetted fabric. I'm just going to show you really quick. This is like a nice tank top with some lace at the top. This is just cotton. And so I'm just going to put it in the dye. And see how if I just do this one shirt right now, I don't need to add any more water on here because it's being completely covered and it's able to move around freely in the dye pot. So now I can just move forward with dyeing this. Um, so I'd want to let this simmer for a minimum of probably, I mean, I'd say a minimum an hour, but I always do longer than that. I always simmer things for a couple hours because that's what's worked for me. But if you, if you aren't sure, just simmer it for an hour and then come back and look at it. Like, look at how much color is already in that after all I did was dip it. So you're going to see it start to change immediately. But the longer you let it sit in there, the deeper the color is going to be. So feel free to let it sit in there for as long as you want. You're going to get this nice peachy pink when you dye with avocado pits and skins. So in order to finish that shirt, I would just simmer it for a few hours, come back and check on it until I'm happy with the color. Um, once this is dyed sufficiently and I'm happy with it, once again, to finish the process, you wring this out as much as possible, especially if you're going to dye in this dye again. You want to wring out all the extra dye that's in here, all the dye solution, so that you can, you know, put your next thing in as much dye as possible. So you're going to wring it out as best as you can. See, I've got this bunched up. You really want to, you really want to make it thinner so you can get as much out as you possibly can. And I can already tell this is going to be a really fun shirt because look at how the threading on this is still white. So the threading on this is not picking up the color, at least not so far. There's a lace on here. So this might be like a polyester or some kind of synthetic fabric that's not going to take the dye. But this is going to look so cool because it's going to have that variation with the white at the end. So I'm going to leave that in there to dye. Um, but you know, you'd just wring it out, rinse it, rinse it, rinse it until it runs clear, and then air dry. And then you can just wash it as you would normally. Um, if it's just a cotton uh, random shirt, I wash it and dry it just like I would any clothes in a washer and dryer machine. But if it's something um, a lot nicer, like a lot of my <clears throat> linen or silk, I will always air dry that. So I usually hand wash and, and uh, um, on a delicate or, or on a delicate cycle in a machine and then air dry it. Um, and you know, that's a good, <clears throat> that's a good practice as far as <clears throat> uh, dyeing garments that you're going to wear. <clears throat> so back to the questions. Can you put the garment in the pot with the avocado parts for the first simmer and then again in just dye water? Yes. Um, so, you know, feel free to play with this experiment, try it with the dye stuff, try it without, try dyeing it twice or just once. I mean, you can try dyeing. I've dyed shirts five or six times with avocado pits and skins because I wanted it to have a deeper color and I wasn't yet satisfied with the color. So I just kept dyeing it until it got deep enough 
um, you know, the, until the color was deep enough that I was happy with it. And think about this, if you're trying out onion skins and avocado skins, feel free to play with the colors in combination. You can dye something with onion skins and then over dye it with avocados, pits and skins. And it's gonna give you more of an orange because you're combining yellow and pink. And you know you can try the fun like tie dye patterns with that um, because if you put little rubber bands or something that's gonna not allow the dye in, if you put tight rubber bands on there, it's gonna create these patterns with the different color variations. So you know, have fun with it, try it, um, try over dyeing, try dyeing with both. You just want to let the garment dry. You know, you'd, you'd want to take this all the way through the process with avocado pits and skins. And then if I wanted to then dye it in yellow in the onion skin bath to get more of an orange, um, once it dries and it's completely done, then I would restart the process, wet it out again, and completely you know, restart with the onion skin dye. So you don't necessarily want to um, uh, you know, go right from one dye to the other because you're gonna contaminate your dye. You still wanna rinse it and dry it, take it all the way through the process first. What can we use to get a green or a blue? Is it possible? Um, I would recommend looking into dyeing with indigo um, it, is a, it is a much more involved process. It is not like uh, onion skins or avocado skins. Um, it's actually a fermentation process, um, but there are plenty of kits and classes out there and I'll be giving you some resources um, that if you want to look into dyeing to get greens, blues, or you know, dyeing with indigo, I'm gonna give you some resources at the end to get you started on that. Have you tried walnuts, green walnuts? They really make your hands go black. <laughs> yes, um, walnuts are a great natural dye. Um, <clears throat> so yes, I have tried that. Okay, um, if there's any questions that I'm missing, just let me know. Um, let, and you know, make sure to type in the chat if you have any questions specifically about the onion skin process or the avocado pits and skins process. Um, I walked you through both of those, but I wanna make sure that you all feel confident enough to now go ahead and do it on your own. While we're chatting, if you have already pre-wetted your, pre your fabric and you're starting to make your dye, you're gonna be ready to die today. So let me know if you have any questions throughout the process. I'm gonna give you my email as well. Um, and we'll send a follow-up email to all the participants. I'll give you my Instagram handle so that if you wanna email me or DM me with questions as you're going through your dye process, please feel free to reach out to me. When dying immediately, do the avocado skins and pits need to be scrubbed? Um, you know, that's a good question. <laughs> I would try, I would, you know, maybe be curious to try it uh, without scrubbing um, and see what happens. I don't think it would hurt, um, but it might be a little bit more messy, like if you have little bits of avocado floating around in there. Um, but if you're going to strain it out anyways, it probably doesn't matter that much. Um, like I've said throughout this, just go ahead and experiment with it. Try it, um, see how it goes. And then whatever works best for you, you can just repeat, repeat that process. Um, so it is 2.30. Um, I'm going to show you some resources. I'm going to keep taking questions. And I'm going to show you some a couple of things that I've died. But um, you know, we, we have reached an hour and a half point. So if anyone needs to go, thank you so much for being here. We are going to send the recorded webinar out after this with my presentation slides. And my presentation slides have a list of all the resources that I'm recommending to you here in a minute. Um, so if anyone needs to go, thank you so much. We'll send you all of that. Um, but you know, feel free to stay tuned because I'm gonna keep showing you um, a couple of things here. Okay, so let me move some things around. So 
someone said, can you talk about water source and color effects? Yes. So remember at the beginning, um, if you were here for the beginning of this workshop, I talked a little bit about how every time you die, you get different, you pretty much get different results every time. It's very hard to recreate. And there are little things that can affect the color of your dye. This is true with every natural dye. So someone who's dying with you know, well water is going to get a different result than someone dying with tap water. And, um, you know, someone dying with spring water may get a different result than them. Um, you could be using the same exact dye stuff in the same process, and the water can slightly change the results. Um, so that's just something to think about when you're doing this. Um, I think it's fun to try different methods, try dying with your tap water and then try dyeing with spring water and see how it comes out differently. Um, <clears throat> I keep a little dye journal um, and this is not very organized, but I just kind of keep uh, track of some of the different colors that I come up with. So this, these were onion skin trials and this is just some raw roving like sheep's wool roving. And then these are different types of yarn this is just a thick cotton rug yarn. Um, this is one of the first times I ever dyed with onion skins. And you can see this is how it started. This is how it came out. So, um, you know, if you want to, you can keep little samples of your work uh, so that you, you can look back and say, oh, you know, um, this result I got last time is so different than the result I got this time. Um, this is from the, some of the first times I dyed with avocado pits and skins. I was getting sometimes brownie colors, tan. This is a very light pink. Uh, you can't see the pink very well on the camera, but um, you know, this is just to say, if you wanna get technical and keep track of your basically dye recipes, um, this is a good way to do it. Just keep little scraps and samples and you can compare each time you dye. Can I make my dye with avocados and onion at the same time, like mix them together in one dye bath? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I would be afraid that I would just get brown. I, I would be afraid it would just come out brown. Um, but like with anything natural dye, just go ahead, experiment with it, just try it. Um, it wouldn't hurt. And I would love to know how that comes out if you do decide to do that. So please email me if you decide to do a combined dye pot. Um, so <clears throat> just before I let you go, I'm going to give you a couple resources um, if you want to continue this practice and continue learning about it. Um, and you know, you can do this from any level of experience. You'd never have to get too technical or rigorous with these things. But these are some things that really helped me when I was starting out and I knew nothing. Um, this book, Harvesting Color, is my number one go-to. It's by Rebecca Burgess. And I'm going to give you a full list of resources in the PowerPoint slides. I'm gonna send this to you after. So don't feel like you have to write down every word. Um, but the first two books I'm gonna show you are the ones I recommend the most for beginner dyers that don't have experience and you just want to try to naturally dye. So Harvesting Color is the first one. Um, this book, really made it dawn on me how much dye plants are all around me. So this gives you some basics to get started. And then she goes through a bunch of different dye plants and she shows you where on the map you can find them. So it's really fun to just, you know, explore different dye plants that are around you. If you're interested in branching out and trying other dyes other than like the food waste dyes. Um, this is a great book to get started doing that. Just keep in mind that a lot of dyes, you don't want to do this process inside your house um, without proper ventilation. Um, but because these are food safe dyes, all the food scrap dyes are great for indoors. The other book that is great for beginners is um, the Natural Colors Cookbook by Maggie Pate. And Maggie, um, she's a great natural dyer. She 
Um, also has a pretty awesome Instagram page with the things that she dyes. Um, if you just look for Maggie Pate, it will come up. Um, and this is like a cookbook. So she focuses primarily on food. So, um, and, it, and it's broken down by color. So she'll do yellows and then she'll go into, you know, like neutral tones. And see, here's a, she has little crafts in here. This is from fennel feathers. Um, and a lot of these dyes do require mordants that we did not get into today, but she has a great, there's great source of information on mordants and getting started with that in here. She has a, a recipe for a natural mordant. So you don't have to use like harsher chemicals. She has a recipe in here for a rust solution that can act as a mordant. Um, so this will have everything you need in it to get started with any dye, even if it includes a mordant. And then this book as well. So these two, I would recommend for any beginner just getting started. And then a couple others, um, if you want to get even more into natural dyes, um, this is the Plant Dye Zine. This is a new publication by Rebecca Desnos. And I really like this one because it gets into these different crafts that you can do with plant pigments. So they go through um, creating like watercolor paints with botanical sources um, and flower pressing and things like that. There's a bunch of different recipes in here from a bunch of different women and craftspeople. And this is a bit more involved, but it has great ideas for if you don't want to just pour out your dye like outside or something when you're done with it. This has great recipes for ways that you can use what's left of your dye pot when you're done to make things like paints um, and to continue using it. If you are interested in learning more about Fiber Shed, um, this is also a really important book. This is also by Rebecca Burgess. Um, she's the one that wrote the Harvesting Color that I showed you earlier, this one. So <clears throat> um, Fiber Shed Dayton is part of why I'm presenting to you today. And if you don't know about Fiber Shed, it's basically an organization that has chapters all over the country um, and probably the world actually for, for that matter. Um, and it's basically about um, a fiber shed is the same concept as a wa as watershed. Um, it's basically fiber local to your area, um, just like these, you know, different dyes or dye plants are local to your area. I consider, you know, the garments that I thrift to be local to this area. Um, so any fiber or dye that lives out its life locally within your region is basically part of your fiber shed. And this book goes much more in depth into how that like sustainable textile systems incorporate makers and farmers and bring local communities together to create the sustainable systems. <clears throat> and just a couple more really quick ones here. This book is very technical. Um, but it's a good one, Wild Color by Jenny Dean. It's a good one if you want to get more into the science behind natural dyes. If you're a chemistry person and you want to do natural dye work, this is the book for you. Um, it also has a wealth of knowledge on mordants and it breaks down each plant um, and the different colors that you can get using different mordants and modifiers. So it's really amazing to see from some of these plants just how many different colors are possible. This book is super simple, um, but I think it's great for artists um, <laughs> who wanna work with natural pigments. And this is by Sasha Dwyer. It's a new book called Natural Palettes. And it basically is a very simple rep representation. So this is spruce branches it just gives you a really basic description of spruce branches um, and what you would do with them. And then gives you 
basic color palettes. And this is also based on using Mortensen modifiers. But if you use nothing, like this is the color you get. So she always shows the basic color as well. Um, this is tansy, for instance. Without a modifier, you're going to get this light green. Uh, pear branches. You can get these nice pinks or peachy pink. So it just goes through all different plants and the different color palettes that you can get um, from natural sources. <clears throat> I'm going to check back on the chat here really quickly, and then I'm going to show you some things that I have dyed. Um, and then that should be it for today. Um, I'll keep taking as many questions as I possibly can. Um, <clears throat> okay, so someone said, can you use this dye for other items like deviled eggs, meringue, hair? Um, <clears throat> I know that people use natural dyes to dye Easter eggs um, with different natural colors. So I have seen people do it with eggs. I don't know what it would be like with deviled eggs. That would be really fun to experiment with. I think um, turmeric, if you think of turmeric um, as a natural dye, um, think about how yellow your food gets when you use a lot of turmeric. Um, so I definitely think it is a possibility that you could use these, but there might be even better sources to use with food that would taste a little bit better and give you color. Um, as far as hair, I really don't think that it would adhere to hair, um, but it's food safe. So I guess you could try it if you wanted to. Um, and she says, I assume you could dye yarn similarly to the fabric. Yes, of course. As a weaver, I am almost always dyeing clothing and yarn. Um, again, they have to be natural fibers. You can't dye synthetic yarns using natural dyes. It has to be cotton or um, silk or hemp or any of the you know, natural cellulose or protein fibers that we talked about in the beginning. OK, and just really quickly, I'm going to show you a couple more examples of things that I've dyed. So um, this is that sweater that I dyed in the or excuse me, the onion skins that I showed you earlier. Um, these are all from the same dye pot. And then you saw this vintage napkin I did with the onion skins as well. Those are all from yesterday um, using the onion skin dye pot that I just taught you how to make. Um, but then another time I've dyed with onion skins, I got more like this yellow. So I just wanted to give you another example of just like how different this can come out. It might have been a lower concentration of onion skins, but you know, really, I don't know um, exactly why. It could have also been uh, altered by the water or the type of pot I was using. Um, this is also a linen blend. And this is just scrap fabric that I can use for anything. Here is a vintage doily that I dyed using onion skins. So these are really fun. Um, you know, you can find these vintage doilies in, in a lot of thrift stores or vintage stores or just your attic. <laughs> um, I have had a lot of these passed down in my family too. So um, this is something really fun to dye. In a lot of vintage fibers or fabrics, you definitely want to consider washing it pretty well before you dye it because they tend, because they're so old, they can tend to have more stains or color variations. Um, but you could just simmer it a little bit in hot water if you're worried about it. Um, otherwise, just go for it and see how it comes out. So that's another example of something you can dye with natural dyes. This is a silk little bandana. So once again, it's this nice pale sunny yellow. It's not really the orange like came out of the onion skin dye pot that I just did. Um, silk is really, really, really fun to work with with natural dyes. Here is an example of when I have dyed some yarn and roving 
with natural dyes and then wove it into a little weaving. Um, so this is actually wool roving. And that is what it looks like before um, spinning into yarn. So before you spin fiber into yarn, it just looks like this chunky, fluffy roving. And so I just used the raw roving here. Um, this is one of the ones I dyed in the fiber camp I was telling you about, where we took the wool all the way from, you know, getting it from the sheep, cleaning it all the way through the process. And then I chose not to spin this. I just wove it directly into this little weaving, but this is the onion skins. This is the rest of these, um, this is just a synthetic fiber. So that's not a natural dye, but the yellow that you see here is all natural. So these are onion skins. And then this is a silk ribbon, which silk ribbons are one of my favorite things to dye. It's so light yellow, it's like a golden color. So that's an example of some yarn or, you know, things that you can do yarn projects with. This is a tank top that I dyed with onion skins. And see how it has these uneven variations in the fabric. I did not cause it to do that. I, this is just a thrifted uh, old tank top. It was white and I was getting kind of tired of it being so bland. So I dyed it with the onion skins and it just came out like this with the natural variation. Um, you know, it's probably because of just some uneven way in which I put it in there or it can be caused by, you know, different um, things adhering to the fabric if you've worn it a ton of times. Um, it's, it can be tough to explain exactly why some garments do that, but I think that that's part of the character of a naturally dyed garment. I think that looks really pretty. Um, so, and I wear this all the time. This is one of my go-to tank tops. And then this is another one of my go-to, this is a linen tank that I dyed with onion skin. So you can see how light it is because I've worn this so many times. I probably wear this tank more than any other tank I own. And so I have to keep re-dyeing it. Um, so I'll wear it for, you know, six months to a year. And then once the color is so faded that I'm like, oh, I want this to look a little bit darker, I'll dye it again. <clears throat> As for the avocado pits and skins, here's another vintage doily that I did with avocado pits and skins. Came out a really nice light pink. This shirt is linen. And this piece is actually getting to the point where I'd probably dye this again. Um, so it is a very, very light pink to the point where on the camera, it may even look a little tan. So that is getting to the point where I wanna dye it again. And this is something that has seen a lot of natural light and that has caused it to fade faster. Um, I actually had this shirt hanging in an art gallery in a coffee shop, and so sun was shining on it, um, you know, for the month and a half that I had this hanging in there. Um, so it eventually just faded the color. And then this piece I'm really excited about. Um, Fibershed Dayton is planning on having a fashion show. Um, I believe it's planned for fall of 2021. Um, they were going to have it in 2020, but of course, you know, got postponed like everything. Um, so I believe in fall of 2021, we're going to ha be having a Dayton Fibershed fashion show. And that means every single garment in the fashion show will be local to Ohio. Um, so I thrifted this shirt here and I dyed it with avocado pits and skins and it just came out with this really nice variation um, of pinks because this is a different material than this lace on top. And then the back has these nice little bows and you can see just how different on the sleeves, like how different the color variations are. So that's really fun. And, you know, I didn't predict that it would come out this dissimilar. 
um, of the of the different fabrics and the different shades. Sometimes you just have to throw it in and see what happens. I like to call this a happy accident when it comes out really nice and and I wasn't expecting it, but that's part of the beauty of working with natural dyes. Um, this is cool to see like just how pink this is already. It's just been sitting in this dye and this dye is even getting cold. Um, it's not even warm right now and it's still taking a lot of color just sitting in here. So that's pretty interesting to see. Um, you know, a lot of dyers try dyeing cold. Um, there's even something called ice dyeing. So, you know, feel free to just experiment. Um, that is, you know, a huge part of the fun of dyeing with natural dyes and just experimenting and see what comes out. I'm going to address some of your questions here. Um, feel free to get any last minute questions in right now because we're going to be wrapping up here um, as soon as I answer any last minute questions. Um, I also will be sending you a follow up with this recording, my presentation slides with all of the resources listed on them and my contact information. If you are dying today or you are going to take this knowledge that you've learned today and die, please reach out to me. I would love to see what you end up dying. Um, something really fun to do if you feel so inclined to take a before picture of your um, garment before you dye it. Um, that way you can remember, you know, what it looked like before. Um, feel free to send me any pictures of anything you dye. I would love to see them. Um, so <clears throat> some questions here. Is the silk ribbon cut from an upcycled garment? No, um, that is a really cool idea though. Um, I actually just had a spool of silk ribbon. Um, because I'm a weaver, I use a lot of different materials to weave. So silk being one of them, um, and but that would be so cool to find an upcycled garment where you could just take the silk ribbon from it. Um, <clears throat> the next question is the repellent oil from sweat. I'm not sure what you mean by that, um, but as far as um, Rachel, can you switch back to my face? Okay, thank you. <laughs> So um, as far as repelling oil, you know, maybe from the garment, I'm assuming, like if you're using a secondhand garment that has been penetrated by sweat, um, you know, it may tend to die unevenly unless you wash it really, really well beforehand. Um, and the, the list of resources I gave you is they go into scouring or, or the process of washing the garments beforehand. Um, very thoroughly. So I'll give you those resources. And if you have any further questions about how to wash a secondhand garment, feel free to reach out to me um, or use any of those resources to help. The next question is, do you dry it without sun? Yes, I do. Um, so I have a little drying rack set up in a room where um, it doesn't get much natural light and I air dry all of my dyed clothing on that rack. Um, with that being said, I definitely have put things on a clothesline before, but that is going to fade your garments faster, much faster. <clears throat> okay, um, so if there are no more last minute questions, um, I just want to let you know um, if you'd like to follow along with me and my work. Um, I'm going to be sending you my Instagram handle that I can, um, that you can follow. Um, it's not official. Uh, some of my personal things are on there too, but I do post a lot of my dye and weaving work there. So feel free to follow along. You can message me. I'm actually going to type my Instagram handle into the chat right now. Um, for anyone who wants to follow me, um, feel free to DM me with questions. Um, no matter how long it's been, I would love to hear from you. Um, I'm really trying to grow my network and build, you know, regrow more roots here in Dayton. Um, and so please don't hesitate to reach out to me, even if you just want to connect. Um, if you don't have any questions, um, feel free to give me feedback on how this presentation went for you. I would love to do things like this in the future. 
Um, and also um, <clears throat> coming up this year, I'm working on launching a brand for my naturally dyed clothes and my weavings. Um, right now, I only do commission work. Um, so if you are interested in a commission, if you're like, oh, this is all fine and good and fun, but I don't want to naturally dye these things myself, um, feel free to email me. I do take commission work on a piece by piece basis. Um, and that is the same with my weaving as well. Um, you can see some more of my weaving work if you'd like to in the Dayton Society of Artists holiday exhibition online. Um, <clears throat> I think that's only going on for a little bit longer, but if you, um, I'll see if I can include that link when I send you out all the resources, if you'd like to see some more of the weaving work. Um, and then this year I'll be launching a brand, like I said, to offer my unique pieces um, to people and I will continue taking commission work. So please stay tuned. I'll keep you all updated um, and uh, I'll, I'll have the participants email list um, so I can keep you all updated on what happens from here. Um, including that anything going on with the fiber shed, including the fashion show coming up later in 2021. <laughs> um, and the last question here, do you have a name for your brand? Yes. So um, I mentioned to you, my grandmother um, is a huge inspiration for me in learning how to weave, um, which led me to natural dyes. And her nickname was Focha. Um, that's kind of pronouncing it with like a little bit of a Polish accent, but I'm just going to call it Fosha um, to be more simple. Um, and it's spelled like, I'm going to type it in the chat here, F-O-C-I-A, Fosha. Um, and so that is going to be my brand name. That was my grandmother's nickname. And she, you know, is the whole inspiration of this craft for me and everything that I've been doing as far as my weaving work as well. Um, so that should be coming out um, sometime here in 2021. <laughs> thank you so much for asking. Um, thank you all so much for your intriguing questions um, and just staying involved. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wish you all a happy new year. And again, don't hesitate to reach out to me should you have any questions or you're excited to show me what you've died. And I think that's it for the day. Um, thank you so much again, Agraria Community Solutions and Dayton Fibershed for this opportunity. Um, I wouldn't be here without them. So thank you so much. Stay tuned to find out any upcoming skill shares that Agraria is doing um, here in the coming weeks. They'll be announcing any more skill shares that they add on. <laughs> thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend.